Dr. Grace Patel stood in front of the sealed doors of the high security laboratory, her hand hovering over the keypad. This was it, the moment she had been waiting for. She had dedicated her life to finding a cure for the deadly pathogen that had ravaged the world for the past decade. And now, after years of hard work, she was about to make a breakthrough. She took a deep breath and punched in the access code. The doors hissed open, and she stepped into the sterile white room. The pathogen, dubbed A-17, was kept in a series of tanks at the back of the lab. It had been engineered to target specific genetic markers, making it lethal to a select group of people. It had already claimed millions of lives worldwide, and Grace was determined to stop it. As she approached the tanks, she noticed something strange. One of them was emitting a low humming sound, and a green light was blinking on the control panel. She checked the readings and felt her heart sink. The tank had breached containment. A 17 was loose in the lab. Panic set in as Grace frantically searched for a way to contain the pathogen. She ordered the lab to be evacuated and contacted the emergency response team. But it was too late. A 17 had already spread through the ventilation system, and within hours, the surrounding city was infected. The government scrambled to enforce a quarantine, but it was too little, too late. The virus spread like wildfire, and people started dying in droves. The city was plunged into chaos, and the once bustling streets were now deserted. As the days turned into weeks, a group of determined citizens banded together to investigate the origins of the virus and expose the truth behind the lab's secretive operations. They had no idea what they were getting into. What they would uncover would shock them to their very core. The group of citizens, consisting of a journalist, a doctor, a police officer, and a hacker, met in a dimly lit basement. They had all lost loved ones to the virus and were desperate to find answers. The journalist Sarah had been investigating the lab for months and had uncovered some unsettling information. The lab had been conducting secret experiments on human subjects, using the A17 pathogen as a means of control. The Dr. James had worked in the lab before quitting in disgust. He had seen firsthand the unethical practices and knew that the pathogen had been engineered to be resistant to all known treatments. The police officer Tom had been patrolling the quarantine zone and had witnessed the government's brutal tactics to control the outbreak. He knew that the government was hiding something. Finally, the hacker, Alex, had infiltrated the lab's computer systems and had found evidence of a cover-up. The lab had been funded by a shadowy government agency, and there were files detailing a plan to use the virus as a means of population control. As the group pieced together the evidence, they realized that they were up against a powerful enemy. The government was willing to do anything to keep the truth from coming out, including eliminating anyone who posed a threat. Despite the danger, the group was determined to expose the truth. They knew that if they didn't, the virus would continue to spread and more people would die. They started to gather more evidence, taking risks and putting their lives on the line. As they delved deeper into the lab's operations, they uncovered something even more sinister. The pathogen had been designed to mutate, and the lab had been intentionally releasing it into the population to study its effects. The virus had become a weapon, and the government had lost control of it. The group knew that they had to act fast. They had to find a way to stop the virus before it mutated into something even deadlier. They hatched a plan to break into the lab and destroy the virus once and for all. But the government was one step ahead of them. They had been monitoring the group's activities and had dispatched a team of mercenaries to eliminate them. As the group broke into the lab, they were ambushed by the mercenaries. A fierce gun battle ensued, and several members of the group were wounded but they managed to make their way to the tanks holding the virus. They set explosive charges and prepared to destroy the virus. But as they were about to set off the charges, they were confronted by the lab's director, a cold and calculating man who had overseen the experiments. He revealed that the virus had already mutated and a new strain was already spreading through the city. He had been using the virus to create a new breed of super soldiers for the government, and he was willing to sacrifice the entire city to achieve his goals. The group was horrified, but they knew that they had no choice. They set off the charges and the lab exploded in a fiery blast. The virus was destroyed, but at a terrible cost. The city was in ruins, and the group had lost several members. As they stumbled out of the wreckage, they realized that their fight was not over. 
They had exposed the truth, but the government would do everything in its power to silence them. They went into hiding, continuing their fight for justice and the truth behind the deadly virus that had devastated their city. The passengers had been excited to embark on a luxurious ocean serenity. Some had saved up for years to afford this vacation, while others had been gifted the trip by their loved ones. They had all eagerly boarded the ship, looking forward to the next few weeks of relaxation, good food, and entertainment. But as the days went by, the passengers began to notice that something was amiss. Some of them had started feeling unwell, and soon enough, the number of sick passengers started to increase rapidly. The crew initially thought it was just a case of seasickness or a minor bug that was going around, but they quickly realized that this was something much more serious. Dr. Johnson had been sitting in her cabin, reviewing her notes when she heard the ship's intercom. Attention all passengers and crew, we are initiating a quarantine protocol. Please remain in your cabins until further notice. She knew immediately that this was bad news. When she arrived on the deck, she saw the chaos that had taken over the once serene atmosphere. People were being ushered into their cabins, and the crew was rushing to set up medical facilities. Dr. Johnson couldn't help but feel a sense of dread. She had seen outbreaks before, but this was different. It was spreading too quickly, and the symptoms were too severe. As she made her way to the makeshift laboratory, she noticed that some passengers were already critically ill. She saw a young couple holding onto each other tightly, both of them struggling to breathe. A mother was frantically trying to wake up her child who had fallen unconscious in her arms. Dr. Johnson felt a pang of guilt. She knew that she and her team had to act fast to save these innocent people. She had never imagined that this routine investigation would turn into a life-or-death situation. As she worked tirelessly alongside her team, she couldn't help but wonder how the passengers would react when they found out the true nature of the ship's mission. How could anyone do this to innocent people? As they worked on finding a cure, Dr. Johnson and her team discovered that the virus was not only highly contagious, but it was also mutating at an alarming rate. They were running out of time, and the situation was getting worse by the minute. Dr. Johnson's thoughts were interrupted by a loud explosion that shook the entire ship. She knew immediately that the organization's agents had found them. They were determined to prevent the vaccine from being developed, and they were willing to sacrifice anyone and anything to ensure that their plan was successful. As the gunshots echoed through the corridors of the ship, Dr. Johnson and her team had to make a difficult decision. They had to prioritize the passengers who were critically ill and administer the vaccine to them first. But they knew that it was a risky move. They had to move fast and hope that they could protect themselves from the organization's agents. Dr. Johnson administered the vaccine to the passengers, one by one, while her team stood guard. They could hear the agents getting closer, and the tension was palpable. The passengers were terrified but they had no choice but to trust the epidemiologists and hope for the best. As the last passenger was injected with the vaccine, the agents burst into the room. A fierce battle ensued, and in the end, Dr. Johnson's team managed to take down the agents, but not before they had caused irreparable damage to the ship. As Dr. Johnson watched the ocean serenity sink beneath the waves, she knew that their battle was far from over. There were still more organizations out there, willing to do whatever it takes to achieve their goals, no matter the cost. But for now, she was just relieved that they had managed to save the passengers, and she vowed to never forget the harrowing experience that they had all been through. Dr. Johnson and her team were eventually rescued by a passing ship and taken back to the mainland. They were hailed as heroes for their bravery and dedication to saving lives. But for Dr. Johnson, the nightmare was far from over. She couldn't shake the feeling of betrayal she felt for the passengers who had put their trust in the ocean serenity. She knew that there were probably more ships out there, conducting similar experiments, and she was determined to put a stop to them. For weeks, she worked tirelessly with government agencies to expose the organization behind the ocean serenity's mission. They tracked down the culprits, but it wasn't easy. The organization was well-funded and well-connected, and they had managed to cover their tracks well. Eventually, the truth came out, and the organization's leaders were brought to justice, but the damage had already been done. The virus had spread to several countries, causing widespread panic and devastation. The death toll was in the millions. In the small coastal town of Havens Bay, 
life was usually calm and uneventful. However, that all changed one day when a sudden and unexplained phenomenon occurred. Red rain started to fall from the sky, covering the town in a crimson blanket. At first, the residents of Haven's Bay were fascinated by the strange phenomenon. They took to the streets to take pictures and videos of the red rain, speculating about what could have caused it. But as the rain continued to fall, people started to get sick. The first symptoms were flu-like, and people brushed them off as a coincidence. But within days, the sickness had spread like wildfire. People were collapsing in the streets, and emergency services were overwhelmed with the number of patients. Dr. Emily Green, the town's only doctor, was at the forefront of the crisis. She worked around the clock, tending to the sick and trying to understand what was causing the illness. But as the number of patients grew, she realized that she needed help. That's when Dr. Green reached out to Dr. Mark Johnson, a visiting scientist who specialized in infectious diseases. Dr. Johnson was hesitant to get involved at first, but the urgency of the situation convinced him to help. Together, Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson worked tirelessly to uncover the source of the infection. They took samples of the red rain and analyzed them, but their tests came up inconclusive. Meanwhile, the sickness continued to spread. People were dying in large numbers, and panic was setting in. The town was in a state of emergency, and the residents were starting to turn on each other. As Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson worked on finding a cure, they started to notice that some people were immune to the illness. They quickly realized that those people were the ones who had stayed indoors and avoided the red rain. This discovery led them to believe that a pathogen was being spread through the rain. They hypothesized that the red color was due to a chemical reaction caused by a foreign contaminant. But as they dug deeper, they realized that the source of the contaminant was not natural. Someone had deliberately introduced it into the atmosphere. Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson had found their antagonist, a mad scientist who had created a bioweapon and was testing it on the unsuspecting residents of Haven's Bay. The realization sent chills down their spines. They knew that they had to act fast to find a cure and stop the contamination from spreading further. But with time running out and the situation becoming increasingly dire, they knew that their chances of success were slim. As the town teetered on the brink of collapse, Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson worked tirelessly to save their community from the deadly pathogen. But would their efforts be enough to prevent the total annihilation of Haven's Bay? Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson knew they had to act quickly if they were to stop the spread of the deadly pathogen. They had a rough idea of where the contamination had come from, but they needed more information to identify the mad scientist who had created the bioweapon. They decided to split up their investigation. Dr. Green took the lead on identifying patients who were immune to the disease and tried to find out what they had in common. Meanwhile, Dr. Johnson focused on the chemistry of the rain and tried to identify the contaminant. After several days of work, they finally made a breakthrough. Dr. Green discovered that all the immune patients had one thing in common. They had all been wearing a specific brand of mask during the rain. The mask was made from a new type of filter that had been specifically designed to block out harmful chemicals. Dr. Johnson's investigation into the chemistry of the rain had led him to a similar conclusion. He had identified a specific compound in the rain that was used in the production of the same filter. Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson knew that they were getting close to finding the mad scientist. They traced the production of the filter back to a company owned by a man named Dr. David Stone. Dr. Stone was a former employee of the U.S. government who had been fired for unethical research practices. He had gone into hiding and had not been heard from in years. Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson suspected that Dr. Stone had created the bioweapon as a form of revenge against the government. They raced to his last known location, a remote laboratory on the outskirts of town. As they approached the laboratory, they could hear strange noises coming from inside. Dr. Green cautiously pushed open the door, and they both stepped inside. The laboratory was a mess, with equipment and chemicals scattered all over the floor. In the middle of the room was a large tank filled with a red liquid. The tank was connected to a complex set of pipes and machines. Suddenly, they heard a voice behind them. Welcome. Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson, said Dr. Stone. I've been expecting you. Dr. Stone stepped out of the shadows, holding a small vial of the red liquid. You're too late, he said. The contamination has already spread beyond this town. There's nothing you can do to stop it. 
Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson stood frozen, unsure of what to do next. But then they heard a loud crash, and the laboratory shook. Dr. Stone lost his balance and dropped the vial, shattering it on the floor. As the red liquid spilled out, Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson realized that the laboratory was collapsing around them. They knew they had to get out before it was too late. They ran towards the door, but Dr. Stone blocked their path. You won't leave here alive, he said, reaching for a nearby syringe. Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson knew they had to act fast. They lunged towards Dr. Stone, tackling him to the ground. The laboratory collapsed around them as they struggled, but somehow they managed to get the syringe away from Dr. Stone and inject him with the antidote they had created. As they stumbled out of the collapsing laboratory, they heard the sound of sirens in the distance. The government had finally arrived, and they were here to contain the contamination. Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson collapsed on the ground, exhausted but relieved that they had saved their town. They knew that the road to recovery would be long, but they were determined to rebuild their community and make sure that nothing like this ever happened again. The residents of Havens Bay never forgot the horror that had descended upon their town. Many had lost loved ones to the deadly pathogen, and they would forever be haunted by the memories of those dark days. But they also remembered the bravery of Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson, who had worked tirelessly to save their community. In the months that followed, the town slowly began to heal. The government had provided resources to help with the cleanup and recovery efforts. The survivors of the outbreak received medical care and counseling to help them cope with the trauma they had experienced. Dr. Green and Dr. Johnson became local heroes, and their work was recognized by the government. They received awards for their bravery and dedication to their community. But despite the success of their efforts, there was always a lingering fear that something like this could happen again. The residents of Havens Bay knew that they were not immune to the dangers of the outside world. As time passed, the memories of the red rain began to fade, but the lessons learned from that dark time stayed with them. They knew that they had to remain vigilant and prepare for any future crisis that may come their way. The town of Havens Bay would never be the same again, but the resilience of its people and the heroism of its doctors ensured that it would continue to thrive in the face of adversity. And as they looked up at the sky, now serene blue, they knew that they had come through the storm and emerged stronger on the other side. The azure waters of the Pacific lapped at the pristine white beaches of the luxurious tropical island resort. Its buildings nestled among the verdant palm trees. This was supposed to be paradise, but something sinister was lurking just beneath the surface. It started with a few isolated cases of a mysterious illness among the staff. But within days, the virus had spread to guests, some of whom were already showing symptoms. Panic set in as the resort was locked down and quarantine measures put in place. Among the chaos, a dedicated nurse named Anna stood out. She had been working at the resort for several years and knew the layout and the staff well. As the virus continued to spread, she teamed up with an off-duty doctor named Jack, who had been staying at the resort as a guest. Together, they made it their mission to find the source of the outbreak and halt its progress. As they worked tirelessly to care for the sick and isolate those who were infected, Anna and Jack began to uncover some disturbing truths about the resort. They found that the management had been ignoring reports of a strange illness among the staff for weeks, hoping to avoid negative publicity and maintain their reputation as a luxury destination. But now, their negligence had put hundreds of lives at risk. Despite the growing danger and uncertainty, Anna and Jack refused to give up. They worked around the clock, struggling to save as many lives as possible while also gathering evidence against the resort's management. But the virus was spreading faster than they could contain it, and the resort was rapidly descending into chaos. As the days wore on, Anna and Jack grew increasingly exhausted and frustrated. They had made progress in identifying the origin of the outbreak, but they were still far from finding a cure. And with the number of infected guests and staff continuing to rise, they knew they were running out of time. As Anna and Jack continued their investigation, they realized that the virus was not a natural occurrence. Someone had deliberately introduced it to the resort, but they couldn't figure out who or why. They suspected that it might be a disgruntled employee or a rival resort looking to sabotage their competition, but they had no concrete evidence to back up their theories. Meanwhile, 
The situation at the resort was deteriorating rapidly. The sick and dying were piling up, and resources were running thin. Anna and Jack were doing everything in their power to keep the patients alive, but they knew they were fighting a losing battle. The virus was too virulent and too fast spreading. One night, as Anna was checking on a patient in one of the resort's villas, she heard a noise coming from one of the other rooms. She cautiously approached the door and listened, trying to identify the sound. Suddenly, the door burst open and a masked figure rushed out, knocking Anna to the ground. When Anna got back to her feet, she saw that the figure was holding a vial of a clear liquid. They turned to face her, and Anna saw the cold, unfeeling eyes of the person responsible for the outbreak. Before she could react, the figure emptied the contents of the vial onto the ground, creating a thick cloud of gas that enveloped them both. Anna felt her throat constricting as she struggled to breathe. She tried to move, but her limbs felt heavy and unresponsive. The masked figure loomed over her, watching as she gasped for air. As Anna's vision began to blur, she saw a glint of something metallic in the figure's hand. It was a syringe filled with an unknown substance. Anna realized with horror that they were planning to inject her with something that would finish her off. With a sudden burst of desperation, Anna kicked out at the figure, catching them off guard. They stumbled backward, dropping the syringe in the process. Anna seized the opportunity to grab the vial and the syringe and bolted out of the room. She ran as fast as she could, ignoring the burning in her lungs and the pounding in her head. She knew that she had to get to Jack and share what she had discovered. She burst into his makeshift clinic, gasping for breath and waving the vial and syringe in the air. What is it? What did you find? Jack asked, his eyes widening at the sight of Anna's panicked state. It's the source of the virus, Anna gasped, holding out the vial. Someone deliberately introduced it to the resort. I don't know who, but this is their weapon. Jack took the vial from Anna and examined it carefully. He recognized the substance inside as a rare and deadly strain of bacteria, one that had been weaponized by rogue bioweapon scientists. We have to act fast, Jack said, turning to Anna. This is beyond anything we can handle here. We need to alert the authorities and get the infected out of here. Anna nodded, feeling a glimmer of hope. They had found the source of the outbreak, and now they had a chance to stop it. She and Jack worked quickly, gathering the sick and the uninfected into groups and making plans to evacuate them to a nearby medical facility. As they were making their final preparations, Anna and Jack were confronted by the resort's management. They had finally realized the severity of the situation and were now desperate to keep it under wraps. You can't do this, the manager said, his voice shaking with fear. We can't let this get out. Think of the damage it will do to our reputation. Anna and Jack stood firm, their resolve strengthened by the knowledge that they were doing the right thing. They refused to back down, even as the situation grew more chaotic by the minute. In the end, they managed to get everyone out safely, with the help of the local authorities and the medical teams that had been mobilized to deal with the outbreak. The resort was shut down, and the management was held accountable for their negligence. Anna and Jack received numerous accolades for their heroic efforts, but they both knew that they had been lucky to survive. The memory of the masked figure and the deadly bacteria they had unleashed haunted them for years to come, a reminder of how quickly paradise could turn into a nightmare. Dr. Alice Thompson was shivering as she stepped out of the plane onto the desolate tundra of the Arctic wilderness. She had been looking forward to this research expedition for months, eager to study the ancient ice formations and explore the remote corners of the planet. But now that she was here, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The research station was a collection of metal buildings huddled together against the harsh landscape, surrounded by towering glaciers and frozen wasteland as far as the eye could see. Alice had expected a warm welcome from her fellow researchers, but the atmosphere was tense and subdued. What's going on? Alice asked one of the scientists, a young man with a nervous expression. It's the virus, he said. We found something in the ice, and we're not sure what it is. Alice's heart rate quickened. A virus? What kind of virus? We don't know it yet, he replied, but we're taking precautions. We don't want it to spread. Alice felt a chill run down her spine. She was a microbiologist, and the thought of a deadly virus lurking among them 
was enough to make her consider turning around and leaving the station. But she had come too far to back down now. Alice steeled herself and set to work, donning a hazmat suit and entering the research lab where the virus was being studied. The room was cold and sterile with bright lights illuminating the rows of test tubes and equipment. Alice joined the other scientists, peering through the microscope at the virus that had been extracted from the ice. It's like nothing we've ever seen before, one of the scientists said. It's ancient, but it's also incredibly resilient. We've tried exposing it to extreme temperatures and radiation, but it just keeps surviving. Alice studied the virus, her mind racing with questions. What was its origin? How had it managed to survive for so long in the frozen tundra? And most importantly, could it pose a threat to human health? As she worked, Alice couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. There was a tension in the air, a sense of unease that seemed to permeate the entire research station. She tried to ignore it and focus on her work, but the feeling only grew stronger with each passing day. Then one morning, Alice woke up feeling sick. Her head was pounding and her throat felt like it was on fire. She stumbled out of bed and made her way to the research lab, where the other scientists were already hard at work. What's wrong with me? Alice asked, her voice hoarse. It's the virus, one of the scientists said grimly. You've been infected. Alice's heart skipped a beat. She had been so careful, wearing a hazmat suit and following all the protocols to avoid contamination. But somehow, the virus had still managed to infect her. The next few days were a blur of fever, chills, and delirium. Alice lay in her bunk, barely conscious as the other scientists worked to find a cure for the virus that was ravaging her body. At first, it seemed like they might succeed. They tested various treatments on Alice, trying everything from antivirals to experimental drugs. But nothing seemed to work. As the days passed, more and more of the scientists began to fall ill. The research station was becoming a death trap, with the virus spreading like wildfire among its inhabitants. Alice watched helplessly as her colleagues succumbed to the virus, one by one. Some died quickly while others lingered for days, their bodies racked with fever and pain. She knew that the situation was dire. They were in a remote location, with no easy way to get help from the outside world. The only hope was to find a cure themselves before it was too late. Alice and the other remaining scientists worked around the clock, poring over research papers and running experiments. They were exhausted, barely sleeping or eating as they raced against the clock to find a solution. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, they made a breakthrough. One of the scientists had found a compound that seemed to be effective against the virus. It was a long shot, but they had nothing to lose. They tested the compound on Alice, watching nervously as she swallowed the pill. For hours, there was no change. But then, slowly but surely, Alice's fever began to subside. She started to feel better, her strength returning little by little. It was a glimmer of hope during an otherwise hopeless situation. The scientists worked feverishly, producing more of the compound and distributing it to the remaining survivors. But even as they celebrated their success, Alice couldn't shake the feeling that something was still off. There was a nagging sense of unease, a suspicion that the virus was still lurking in the shadows, waiting to strike again. As she drifted off to sleep that night, Alice couldn't help but wonder, had they truly found a cure or had they merely delayed the inevitable. The next morning, Alice woke up feeling better than she had in days. Her fever was gone, and her strength had returned. She got up and made her way to the research lab, where the other scientists were already hard at work. Good morning, Alice, one of them said with a smile. How are you feeling? Much better, thanks, Alice replied, her eyes scanning the lab. What's the latest on the virus? We're making progress, another scientist said. We've isolated the compound that seems to be effective against it, and we're working on synthesizing more of it. Alice nodded, her mind racing with questions. How long would it take to produce enough of the compound to treat everyone at the station? And what if the virus mutated, rendering the cure useless? As she worked, Alice couldn't shake the feeling that something was still off. She had a sense of foreboding, a suspicion that they were missing something crucial in their efforts to combat the virus. Then, one day, Alice stumbled upon a piece of evidence that would change everything. She was in the lab, analyzing a sample of the virus under the microscope, when she noticed something strange. 
There was a small microscopic structure within the virus that she had never seen before. Alice called over one of her colleagues, a virologist who specialized in the study of viruses. Take a look at this, she said, pointing to the strange structure. What do you make of it? The virologist studied the sample, her eyes widening in surprise. I've never seen anything like this before, she said. It's almost like, like the virus was engineered. Alice felt a chill run down her spine. Could it be true? Had the virus been deliberately created as some sort of biological weapon? She and the other scientists dug deeper, analyzing the virus's genetic structure and tracing its origins. What they found was shocking. The virus had been buried deep within the ice for millennia, but its genetic makeup was unlike anything they had ever seen. It contained sequences of DNA that were clearly not of natural origin, leading the scientists to conclude that the virus had been artificially engineered. As the truth began to emerge, Alice realized that they were facing an enemy far more insidious than they had ever imagined. They weren't just fighting a deadly virus, they were up against an unknown enemy with unknown capabilities. And worst of all, they were trapped. There was no easy way to escape the research station, no way to get help from the outside world. They were alone, facing a threat that could potentially wipe out all of humanity. Alice knew that they had to act fast. They had to find a way to stop the virus, to prevent it from spreading beyond the Arctic wilderness and into the rest of the world. But as the days wore on, it became increasingly clear that their time was running out. The situation at the research station grew more desperate with each passing day. More and more of the scientists fell ill, and even those who had seemingly recovered from the virus were starting to show symptoms again. Alice and the other remaining survivors worked tirelessly to find a solution, but it seemed that they were always one step behind the virus. Every time they thought they had found a cure, the virus mutated and rendered their efforts useless. As the situation grew more dire, tensions began to rise within the research station. Some of the scientists became paranoid and distrustful, convinced that their colleagues were intentionally infecting them with the virus. Alice tried to stay focused on the task at hand, but she couldn't ignore the growing sense of unease that permeated the station. It was as if the virus had not only infected their bodies, but their minds as well. One day, as she was walking through the station, Alice heard a commotion coming from one of the labs. She rushed inside to find a group of scientists gathered around the computer, their faces pale and panicked. What's going on? Alice asked. It's the satellite images, one of the scientists said, her voice trembling. Look. Alice looked at the computer screen, her eyes widening in horror. The satellite images show that the ice around the research station was melting at an alarming rate and a massive crack had formed in the glacier just a few miles away. We have to get out of here, Alice said, her voice urgent. The ice is unstable. We could be buried alive. But there was no way out. The only helicopter at the station had been damaged in a storm, and there was no way to repair it. They were trapped, with no hope of escape. As the ice continued to melt, the scientists watched in horror as the crack in the glacier grew wider and deeper. They knew that it was only a matter of time before it reached the research station. And then, one night, it happened. The crack widened, and the glacier began to shift and groan. The ground shook beneath their feet as the ice broke apart, sending huge chunks hurtling toward the research station. Alice and the other scientists ran for their lives, dodging falling debris and stumbling over the treacherous terrain. They made their way to a small makeshift shelter that had been set up as a last resort. As they huddled together, listening to the deafening roar of the ice collapsing around them, Alice realized that this was it. They were going to die here, in this frozen wasteland, victims of a deadly virus and a planet that seemed to be turning against them. But even as she felt despair creeping in, Alice refused to give up. She and the other scientists continued to work, desperate to find a way to stop the virus before it could spread beyond the Arctic. And then, finally, they had a breakthrough. They discovered a compound that was effective against the virus, and they were able to produce enough of it to treat everyone at the research station. It was a small victory, but it gave them hope. As they waited for rescue, Alice and the other survivors worked to synthesize more of the compound, determined to find a way to stop the virus once and for all. And as they looked out at the frozen landscape, watching the ice melt away and the sun rises above the horizon, Alice knew that they had won a battle but the war was far from over. 
They had faced a horror beyond their wildest dreams, but they had survived, and they would continue to fight no matter what lay ahead.